Coming up next on Arizona Horizon, hearings wrapped up today on a lawsuit to allow more time for some medical marijuana dispensaries to open. We'll have an update. We'll speak to a reporter who was allowed into the area where 19 firefighters died battling the Yarnell Hill fire. And we'll hear why local nonprofits are concerned over recent changes in suggested performance standards. Those stories next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simons. Over 40 medical marijuana dispensaries have opened in the state with prospective proprietors facing an August 7th deadline to turn in the required permits. Several dispensaries sued to extend that deadline, resulting in three days of evidentiary hearings held over the past week. The director of the State Department of Health Services will join us in a moment to talk about those hearings. But first, producer Lori Allen and photographer Scott Olson take us to a Tempe dispensary that has a connection to the lawsuit. Despite state regulations and recommendations from the police department, Harvest of Tempe opened May 4th. It didn't help that from the time we started writing checks till the time we opened was more than double the time that we anticipated it would be and the expenses were significantly greater than we anticipated. Extra costs included bulletproof glass and several security cameras and steps you can't see, such as measures to make sure there is no marijuana odor. The difficulty with this industry is you have a new industry, you have a lot of preconceived notions about what these places will be. White says Tempe is a progressive city, but it still has been demanding. I don't think any city says, wow, a, a medical marijuana dispensary, great. Aside from his work with Harvest of Tempe, Steve White is an attorney representing a dispensary that had trouble getting the state to approve its location. On behalf of that client, I am seeking additional time to open whatever amount of time that we were going through the debate about whether our building is plopped in the middle of a street or not should be tacked on to the end of the deadlines to allow, allow that client to open a little later. Attorney Ryan Hurley doesn't have a client in the lawsuit, but understands why some of those running clinics feel an extension to the deadline would be unfair. I think that there's a, 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 sen a sentiment among the ones that were able to open in time that, uh, hey, we, we were able to do it, uh, why can't anybody else, and why should they get an extension when, when we worked very hard to, to get there. And we have had a number of patients come back and say since they've been coming here, they sl they're, they're sleeping better than they have in their entire life. Hurley and White do agree that getting medical marijuana to people in pain is the ultimate goal. Thankfully, the patients are starting to have safe, reliable access at dispensaries as the voters intended. And here now to talk about the hearings on the lawsuit to extend the deadline is Will Humble, director of the Arizona Department of Health Services. Good to see you again. Good evening, thanks. Well, so the focus of the hearings was basically a bunch of folks saying we need more time, correct? Yeah, there is about 18 of the registration certificate holders that say they need more time in order to get their approval to operate. And, you know, one of the nuances of the regulations that we put together was that if you got your registration certificate last summer, which was August 7th, uh, you have a year to get up and running. And if you don't get up and running in that first year, your certificate expires. And so we're up against a deadline here in about two weeks where if folks don't get their approval to operate in the next couple of weeks, uh, you know, unless the court changes something, you know, those certificates will expire and then we'll start on the second round. The approval to operate, I mean, obviously we have cities involved, we have other factors, everything from construction to, you know, the odor of marijuana in the building and all that kind of stuff. Uh, makes sense to you that some folks are finding it tough sledding? Oh, from the very beginning, I knew that the biggest barrier to getting these dispensaries up and running would be issues involved with zoning and local restrictions. I mean, you know, our regulations put sort of the, the baseline regulations in place. But then, uh, no matter where you're going to site your dispensary, you have to get permission from your local jurisdiction, uh, what's called a, a certificate of occupancy. And, and some of those certificates are difficult to get. Uh, the clip that you saw in Tempe, you know, Tempe's got standards over and above the standards that we developed. And so there's no doubt that this was a challenge in some jurisdictions. And, you know, some jurisdictions were more challenging than others. And, uh, you know, I said that in court. Yeah, indeed. And we should mention the judge has to make the final decision, not you, correct? Yeah, so this uh, case is in Superior Court. I was uh, a witness for a few hours last week. Uh, final day of testimony was today. The judge is going to take 
back the testimony, the witnesses, and all the evidence and come up with a decision here in the next uh, week or so. Uh, and then give some direction about whether to dismiss this suit or uh, whether to side with the plaintiffs and say, hey, these unforeseen circumstances dictate that uh, agency, y you shall give them more time, and we'll just have to wait and see what the judge says. Do you think they have a point, especially when they say that this, this White Mountain dispensary, the zoning thing with the county, uh, that thing is in court. I think it's a, still in an appeals court right now. Right. Um, some are saying that has a chilling effect because it slows the whole process down. Those kinds of, do they make sense to you? Oh, absolutely. I mean, uh, you know, by the way, the chilling, the chilling effect goes way back to the beginning when I was on this show about two years ago talking about the difference between state and federal law. So there's always been this uh, sort of dichotomy of state and federal law not being in sync. And so that was really the first chilling effect. And, you know, there have been other things that have happened along the way that maybe weren't fully, uh, you know, you couldn't really anticipate. But, you know, that's the nature of capitalism. I mean, you know, you, you jump into business and you do the best you can to plan, but market forces and unforeseen circumstances sometimes end up driving the day. Well, and that seems to be the argument among some dispensers who said, you know, we a lot of blood, sweat, and tears on our part to get done by the deadline, not really fair to extend that. Right. I mean, that's the other side of this is that if, you know, if folks get more time to get their dispensary up and running, you know, in a sense, the folks that really hustled and got this thing done on time um, say, hey, wait a minute, I paid contractors extra money to get in here quickly, and I yeah. guess I didn't have to. So August 7th, as we stand right now, that August 7th deadline is still on, correct? Yes. Okay. Judge, when are you expecting some sort of ruling here, some sort of decision? Well, I don't really know, but the judge knows because I was in court and everybody knows that this decision needs to come at some point before August 6th, so within the next couple of weeks. Are you expect? let's say, let's say August 7th stays there, let's say they move it to the 14th, the 20th, whatever it is. When that last day arrives, are you expecting an absolute avalanche of paperwork and applications and things? No, not really, because uh, you know at the beginning you talked about how we've got 40 dispensaries. Yes. Well, it's actually 62 now. Oh, so okay. So we've got 62 with operating licenses okay. right now, and we have 21 that have asked for their opening inspection. So in general, most of those are actually ready to go. So we're really looking at something close to 80 out of the 98 that could potentially make the deadline. So it's really just a handful of these applicants that haven't or don't appear to be able to make uh, the deadline because of local jurisdiction issues and other things. Okay, so uh, as far as the whole program stands, what are we seeing around the state? How many folks now are within the 25-mile boundary and, and those sorts of things? Give us an update on the whole program. So the 25-mile, what you're talking about is that if you live within 25 miles of a dispensary, you're not authorized to cultivate yes. when you renew your card. And right now, 90% of Arizonans, or actually 90% of cardholders, live within 25 miles of a dispensary right now. Okay. And there's about 38,000 qualified patients. Okay, and is everything otherwise going along as expected? Not too many speed bumps and surprises? Well, there's been plenty of speed bumps and surprises with this, mostly related to lawsuits and that kind of stuff, but it's, you know, if you, it's water off a duck's back when you're in this job. <laughs> All right. Well, it's good to have you here, good for the update, and we'll keep in mind, uh, we'll keep an eye on this thing. If the deadline is extended, we may have to have you back and see uh, why and how long? All right. All right. want to hear from you. Submit your questions, comments, and concerns via email at ArizonaHorizon at ASU.edu. 
The site where 19 hotshot firefighters lost their lives battling the Yarnell Hill fire was open to the media for the first time yesterday. Veteran wildfire reporter Jim Cross of KTAR Radio was there. He joins us now. Jim, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, uh, uh, give us a general, we have some photos in a second here, but give us a general description of the scene. It brought it home to reality when he went into the canyon, how bad this was. The thing that really surprised me was that pictures didn't do it justice, mm -hmm. how rugged, how deep this canyon really was. And when you're on the ground inside of that canyon, it, it's enormous. I want to get to specifics in a second here, but who was allowed access? Uh, reporters. Uh, so far, it's been only fire people that went up in there, but it's reporters, TV, you know, photographers. And we went in there with uh, some of the fire people, Jim Pax and Daryl Willis with Prescott Fire and so on. And here we go seeing uh, reporters going in there. Um, all right, uh, the area, we can see lots of rocks. We can see, obviously, uh, high walls there. Mm -hmm. Again, I, I've heard you describe this as a horseshoe kind of an area. Yeah, a three-sided box canyon. Yeah. Uh, basically, uh, very high walls, hundreds of feet high, boulders, big boulders on the sides, you know, some the size of buses, Volkswagens and so on and so forth, pickup trucks. And the firefighters were where? Firefighters, if, it, if you compare it to a horseshoe, they were at the very curve of it and the back of it. And they were as far back against the canyon wall pretty much as you could go. We're seeing a t-shirt on a cactus here. What's that all about? That's a Granite Mountain Hotshot t-shirt. Uh, it was placed on a uh, burnt cactus, prickly pear cactus. And we were asked to touch it when we went by. Uh, uh, you know, to be solemn. Interesting, interesting. Yeah. All right, back to the area and back to the region. Um, obviously, it looks like a moonscape right now, this yeah. whole area. Uh, before, what did we see as far as uh, vegetation? How high were things? It was brushy. I mean, in Manzanita, probably oak in there, maybe some chaparral. Six, uh, seven, eight feet, something yeah, like that? Yeah, and, and it was heavily covered. Well, not heavily covered, but it was it definitely vegetation was in there. This photograph right here, now you, you mentioned a box canyon, kind of horseshoe-esque. Are we looking kind of straight toward the back of the canyon here, or is that off to maybe one of the sides? That would be straight back toward the back of the canyon right there. And what's the fence for? Uh, the fence is to basically protect the site uh, where the firefighters uh, deployed their shoulders and uh, where they eventually died in this fire to keep people away from it. Were they in the, as far as you can tell, were they in the middle of this clearing or were they along the sides of one of the walls? Um, they were in the middle. I mean, it's, it's closer to the middle yeah. than it is the sides. It's not a, a you know, hugely wide canyon. But it's it's you know half a mile in or so. Obviously not on the hills. They were within in the bowl area. They were on the floor, yeah. Yeah, and and were they, were they close? To, I've heard reports that they were very close together. Uh, is that what you're hearing? What you saw up there as well, as far as the, the terrain is concerned, they were pr probably in the same spot. Oh yeah, they were all in the same spot. The shoulders were deployed side by side by side. Uh, they were very close to each other. When we look at these photos uh, that we're seeing here, and again, there's the fence walling off the area, and they were seeing the, the, the mountainside, the, the the ravine, whatever you want to call that, the hillside. Um, do we know how they got into the bowl area? I mean, there's a ranch nearby, correct? There's a ranch about a half a mile away uh, from where they were at. And we talked to Prescott, you know, fire, wildland fire chief, uh, Darrell Willis yesterday. He believes they were trying to save that ranch. And the ranch was saved. It was saved. And the fire at one point was going away from them. It turned around with that wind shift, the thunderstorms, 50 miles an hour, and came back toward them. They were about as far back in this canyon as you can get when they deployed. There is no way that you could have climbed out of that canyon. On a, on, a, on a day when you weren't carrying chainsaws and backpacks and everything yes. else, it would have taken a half an hour, 45 minutes to get out of that And canyon. they were carrying that equipment to clear brush, correct? I mean, they, they, they were in there for a purpose. Yeah, they were in there cutting away brush that could have burned uh, in their spot. Where they deployed, they had cut away, you know, brush with chainsaws, axes, and so on and so forth. And again, we're seeing what I, I would imagine now, that would be the opening to the, the pseudo horseshoe, the box canyon that, that you were is, talking about. Just outside of the ranch. And that picture right there really gives you a pretty good scale and, and scope of how, you know, rugged yes. that canyon is and how rough it is. And that fire burned, I mean, all the way to the top of those walls? Burned. And over. Oh, completely scorched. Yeah. The rocks are, are dark uh, from fire. Some of the rocks cracked. Uh, you know, the fire ended up burning about 8,500 acres, but it, yeah, it, it scorched the canyon. And uh, as far as uh, where the fire came and where it went, pretty hard to figure that out from from. Yeah, I mean, there's so still, the investigation is still underway. <laughs> uh, we're going to have an investigation, we believe, by late August or maybe mid-September at the latest. 
and I think that will tell a little bit more. There's been a lot of speculation about what happened, and yesterday we got a pretty good reality check from you know talking with uh, the fire people up in there what really happened. Um, you know, the canyon, like I said, it would have been impossible to climb out of. They deployed their shoulders. That's always a worst case scenario, last ditch effort. And, and, you know, these shoulders are good to about 500 degrees, and this fire was burning much, much hotter than that. And moving very fast. Very fast. About four miles. It moved about uh, four miles in 20 minutes. I've heard some estimates. I haven't seen it confirmed that the fire might have been moving like 20 feet a second. Yeah. Um, the fire moved incredibly fast. The conditions in there must have been just unbelievable. Well, and you, when you see that box canyon, obviously you were there. Yeah. The, the concept of swirling winds makes a heck of a lot of sense. Yeah. I mean, these, these thunderstorms, this was a very erratic thunderstorm. I mean, the fire, as I am being told, was moving away from them, came back toward them. It probably blew in several different directions. It was all over the place. And we started by you saying it kind of all brought this home to you. Uh, did being there give you a different perspective? It gave me a different perspective. It, it really sinks in the reality, and it's been a tough story to cover for almost a month anyway. It really brought it home, and to see the canyon where this happened gave you a better idea of what happened and the size and scale of it. It's just it, it, totally different when you see it in person, and really, honestly, pictures don't do it justice. Yeah. Well, Jim, we do thank you for joining us and uh, sharing those photographs with us. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ted. Get the inside scoop on what's happening at Arizona PBS. Become an aid insider. You'll receive weekly updates on the most anticipated upcoming programs and events. Get the aid insider delivered to your email inbox. Visit azpbs.org to sign up today. Three of the leading sources of charity information recently changed their position on the importance of administration and fundraising costs to nonprofits. It's a move that some see as a paradigm shift in the nonprofit community. Here with more is Steve Zabilski, Executive Director of St. Vincent de Paul, and Ellen Soloway, Program Officer for the Virginia G. Piper Charitable Trust. Good to have you both here. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, all right, this is an open letter from three. There's so much. Let's define some terms here. Who are these groups and why are they so important? Well, these are groups, Ted, that people typically look to as they provide advice to uh, individuals and businesses about nonprofit organizations. So you can find things like a charity's uh, financial ratio and overhead ratio, uh, information on executive compensation, governance practices, uh, you know, a whole host of things on their programs. And this is GuideStar, Charity Navigator, and a branch of the Better Business Bureau? Yes, that's correct. All right, now, th th they talked about overhead ratio. I mean, I read the letter, and not coming from the nonprofit community, it took a couple of readings to try to figure it out here, but they seem to have a changing opinion of overhead ratio. What is overhead ratio? Well, overhead ratio is the amount of money that you spend, that a nonprofit spends on its administrative costs and its fundraising costs, and the percentage overall of what it spends to deliver its programs. What, what's a healthy percentage? Well, that's a difficult question. I would argue that there isn't a healthy percentage per se. And the Better Business Bureau and Guide, not so much GuideStar, but Charity Navigator, um, set a level of about 30% that they said it should not exceed that. But I would argue and would ask Steve if, if he would agree with that number. Yeah, well, so what do you think? Is 30%? Well, is this one of these things where it's apples and oranges? It, it really is. Typically, people think that the lower is better that the more money that a charity spends directly on programs and not on things like overhead is good. But that, that really is faulty thinking. Just as an example, 
uh, they're, t they're saying to a charity, if you spend any money on marketing expense or any money on telling your story, any money on fundraising, that's bad, even though it might help the charity to grow and to serve more people. So the letter said that, the, that this overhead ratio at or near 30 percent, whatever they, whatever they decide is, is a good number, it's a poor measure of a charity's performance and that focusing on overhead can do more damage than good. W what are they getting at here? What they're really saying is it's simply not... Uh, as easy as looking at a single number to say, well, here's a really good charity, or this charity is not a good charity. So you have to look really instead at what are the programs, what are the outcomes, what are the types of things they're accomplishing, not simply on, well, gee, they're not investing in their tax return or auditors or human resources or marketing or fundraising, as Ellen noted. Well, with that in mind, um, why is there so much concern over the letter? Because that would seem to make sense. Well, I think, you know, the overhead ratio was, was an easy measure. Uh, that it theoretically gave you guidance on, on whether or not you should invest in a nonprofit as a donor or funder. And when you take away the overhead ratio, if suddenly you can't look to that, it becomes confusing for many. Well, how do I decide um, whether or not this is a nonprofit worthy of my investment? So I think concern is, is well, if you take that away, then, then how do I proceed? And indeed, it, it sounds as though from a distance uh, they might be saying, uh, watch out because of, you know, these are, they're spending too much and that 30 percent they shouldn't have spending. It sounds to me like they're saying a lot of charities should spend more. Uh, absolutely, yeah, they probably should. Maybe not over an extended period of time and I don't think there is any one particular number and that is what makes it confusing for people. But yes, um, most nonprofits are starved. I think I read a statistic that 62 percent of people think that um, nonprofits are spending too much on overhead. So that's a very difficult um, attitude to fight when in fact probably they're spending way too little on overhead. So 60 some odd percent of people think charities spend too much on overhead. Now you've got these, these groups, these, these leading indicators for charity information saying you may not be spending enough. That's What's right. a nonprofit to do? Well, it really, to come on your show, Ted, and to, <laughs> and to educate people that this is a fundamental paradigm shift. And, and, and Ellen is right that uh, having worked in the nonprofit industry for 17 years, I, I think every single nonprofit that I've seen, they starve themselves on overhead. So they don't invest in technology, they don't invest in training their people, they don't invest in fundraising or development because people are gonna view that as bad when in fact that's how you can grow your organization to, to help more people, to solve difficult problems, to end homelessness, to cure cancer, but we have to make these critical investments. So paradigm shift notwithstanding, or perhaps because it is a paradigm shift, how does a nonprofit respond? What does this mean now to the nonprofit landscape? Well, I think it gives them permission to say we can make these critical type of investments and not have to apologize for them. That in fact that we should be judged like any other for-profit business would be judged. We'll see an ad on TV and we don't sit here and say, gee, that business is wasting money advertising, whether they're selling shoes or food or whatever. But if we see a charity advertise on TV, many people think, well, that's a waste of money, even though the charity, that can help them to raise additional funds. And, and this goes to that very issue. From, from these organizations, obviously, this is a big change here regarding this, this overhead ratio. It's either really important or right now it's not all that important. With that in mind, again, how does a nonprofit respond, and is this not an opportunity to be a good thing for nonprofits? Yes, I think it is, and I, I think nonprofits have to work with their boards of directors to uh, try to make sure that they understand the need in doing this and to speak to their donors and their funders. And uh, very, very important that the donors and funders understand this as well. I will say that uh, Piper Trust has never looked at overhead. Never, but many, many funders and donors do. And, and so, th and that's basically the big concern here is that you, you mentioned a kind of an easy uh, metric here. Uh, folks kind of look at that and base their decision. All of a sudden, is it not going to be there anymore from these groups, or are they just changing the emphasis? I think they're changing the emphasis. They're not saying um, that you shouldn't, it shouldn't exist at all, just that it should not be the one and only indicator of a nonprofit's worth and right. effectiveness. How will, right. how will this impact fundraising? How does it impact things like salaries, the whole nine yards? I, I think, Ted, it gives nonprofits again that permission that they can act more like a for-profit organization that they can hire good people they can make investments in infrastructure they can do things like training a computer system a phone system and again not have to feel like they're doing something wrong that it's taking away from the mission of the organization but in fact is enhancing it to, for its both short-term and long-term that it, it, it's building the very viability the stability of a nonprofit so when the letter says that people served by charities don't need low overhead they need high performance you would agree? Absolutely. Most definitely. So yes. ba basically it's, definitely. it's a change in how things are done and a change as far as what information donors have, but it's also an opportunity. Yes, absolutely. And certainly the overhead ratio never was a 
proper reflection of nonprofit effectiveness. It didn't really tell you about the quality or effectiveness of the programming at all. So it was a false indicator. And getting rid of that false indicator, or at least moving it and receding into the background, will be extremely valuable. But a little bit of warning probably would have been nice, huh? Well, it, it, it actually was one of those things that caught everyone by surprise, but it was a pleasant surprise. It, it, was, it was something that many charities have felt has been an incorrect way they've been judged for, for many, many years. So it's really the starting point of a conversation now, not the ultimate decision on which organization is good, which organization isn't as good. All right. Very good. Good to have you both here. Thanks for joining us. Thank, Thank you, you for having us. And that is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great evening. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you.